Thank you, guys. Um, can you hear me just nice? I think I can hear myself properly. All right, my name is Alex Tej. I am uh, currently working with uh, HP. I am one of the cloud consultants, and uh, today we are going to cover how to run production workloads in a programmable infrastructure. In this case, I will be using OpenStack, Helion OpenStack. So before we get started, can I check with you guys how many of you are familiar with OpenStack? All right. Uh, how many of you actually are running OpenStack today, either in production or as development or? OK, yeah, that's quite an improvement. Actually, I'm asking because initially I tried to run this session as an introductory OpenStack, but apparently there is a lot of people familiar already, so I have to do something a little bit more difficult in order to earn my ticket for the session. So <laughs> today we're going to cover quite a few use cases, and um, this is pretty much what I am hoping to, to do during the next 25 minutes. So we're going to talk about advanced neutron use cases, especially load balancer as a service. I don't know if you guys heard about that one. Firewall as a service is another one. Auto scaling is one of the features widely used today. So basically, we're just going to DD one of our, of our instances after we manage to spawn it and generate quite a lot of load. And hopefully, Monasca will pick it up and spawn a new instance inside the web farm. That's quite an interesting one. And the last one is um, data cloning as a service which is quite a nice use case for those DevOps who perhaps are here today uh, and are looking to clone an exact copy of your production database into a testing or QA environment. So this is a way to fully automate that procedure using OpenStack. All right, let's get started. If I sound a bit nervous, it's because I'm going to run four live demos, and uh, I just don't know what could go wrong. So <laughs> let's get started with the first one. OK, we're going to showcase first heat orchestration. All right, uh, this one is a pretty straightforward one. Let me swap the displays for a minute. I'm going to log in into my OpenStack environment. And uh, in this particular case, this is what we are going to call the production tenant. This production tenant, let me see, I have nothing under my sleeves. Shouldn't have anything at the moment. So the only thing that we have is the external network, but there are no routers, there are no networks. They are no instances whatsoever. So what I will do at this very moment, uh, the font is fine. I try to enlarge it a bit for you guys to see it. I think it's looking just fine. All right, let me just stand the whole demo. OK, this is a script basically calling my heat orchestration template. And uh, hopefully, what we should start seeing in the background is that networks are going to start to be created, hopefully a virtual router as well. Uh, we will have three instances. Two of them are going to be part of the web farm, which is running Tomcat. And uh, we will have one of them as the database server for the backend. In this particular case, I am using Oracle. Uh, Again, this one a production environment, so the guys were not that keen to use MySQL, and they wanted to use something slightly more enterprise. But that's fine. It should work exactly the same if we use MySQL. We will have a load balancer as well, standing in front of the Tomcat web servers. And uh, later on, we will trigger the creation of a firewall. This thing could last for about two to one and a half minutes to create. So in the meantime, let me go back to the slides and let me try to elaborate a little bit more on what we are doing here. OK. Uh, oops. Wrong use case. No, that's the one. All right, like I mentioned before, two Tomcat servers starting in front. We have an Amphora load balancer. How many of you guys are familiar with Amphoras? All right, and for us, it's quite a new concept since uh, Mitaka, perhaps Liberty release that we have in OpenStack. In the past, we used to use Load Balancer as a service, as a namespace, meaning to say that Load Balancer is actually created inside the kernel namespace. And uh, then we try to leverage on the namespaces, basically to use a shape proxy and uh, to load balance all the traffic across the web servers that are members of this particular namespace. Uh, obviously, that has some disadvantages. Uh, which we will mention later, but is pretty much due to the fact that if the namespace is living in a particular compute host and that compute host dies, then that load balancer dies with the server, right? There is not really a 
fail over the scenario which you can leverage for you to continue to be working and, and keep your traffic going. So the Amphora pretty much what it does is it creates another virtual machine which is actually not seen by the tenant. In this case, the production tenant is only seen by the admin and this particular instance is running HA proxy. So we can configure a cluster of HA proxies and those are the ones that are going to run the load balancer as a service inside OpenStack, okay? So it's quite an improvement. As of Mitaka, we have uh, automatic failover already. If one of the compute dies and happens to be running an Amphora, another compute will take over the Amphora creation, okay? Let's see how our demo is going. Oh, that was fast, actually. Okay, let's take a look. So we did some checks during the heat orchestration uh, template creation, and uh, pretty much we created the stack. We have a pool of load balancers created already with a floating IP, and we added as members our uh, web servers. Let's take a look at Horizon one more. Hopefully we should be able to see quite a number of instances here. Three of them in this case, all of them are running. I'm going to borrow a console for the database. Let's see if it's already up and running. It is, oh, it was quite fast today. Hmm, okay, not so good news. All right, these are the volumes. The volumes, this is a Cinder volume. It says to be mounted inside the database server. Apparently it's not from the check that I did just now. So the Cinder volume was pre-created before the hero orchestration template kicked in. And the reason why is because this database is supposed to have persistent data. And uh, for our customers, if the database server dies, we should be able to find a way to spawn a new database server just attached to the current instance uh, Cinder volume running the data files, and we should be able to just roll forward to the latest transaction and, and bring it back offline. So this portion is fine. We have the Cinder volume created there. It reports that it's attached. From here, I don't really see it attached. Let's run an, let's run an FDisk. Yeah, okay. Let me see it a bit. Let's go back to volumes. but could go wrong. <laughs> okay, guys, again, this is supposed to happen as part of the heat orchestration template, okay? Attaching the volumes. Like I say, this is a pre-created volume. So let me just attach it again, okay? And manage attachments, database server, sweet. Okay, let's run another F disk. I can see it. <coughs> all right, so these are my order data file systems, okay? All the archive logs, the control files, the redo logs, everything is sitting in this file system. Once more, it's supposed to be fully automated, but since the volume was most there, I am afraid I will have to start the database manually. Okay, while this one is going, Let's go back to the horizon and let's take a look at the load balancer portion. Okay, inside network, we go to load balancers and we should be able to see that we have two members and hopefully they are active. Yes, both of them are active and they are known as web one and web two, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we can see it here. Okay, so what I will do is let me run a curl script that is basically going to test the load in the load balancer and we should be able to see that it works in round robin fashion. Okay, it's going to web one, web two, goes back to web one. Okay, so this portion is more or less fine, all right? So, going back to our demo. We already have an orchestrated environment. We see a little bit with the Oracle portion. Again, Oracle is not part of OpenStack, so I can push the blame away. 
but is something that is supposed to be as part, working as part of the automation. Okay, for the load balancer um, as a service, we are going to auto scale the next demo with some thresholds. So uh, with the heat orchestration template, we pretty much monitor the CPU load. We can monitor the memory load as well. So what I will do is I will trigger another script that is going to generate quite a number of DDs in uh, web one, and it's going to generate a lot of CPU load for a period of time. So Monasca, which is my monitoring and scale in OpenStack, is going to pick up this load and is going to trigger another instance, which is going to join the web farm. So we will have three web servers. Okay, there are some limitations, like I mentioned before, to Elvis version two. Even today with Amphora, there are two different factors that we have to consider in uh, load balancing as a service. The very first one is what we call the data plane. The data plane is your data, pretty much traveling through the network. And uh, this one is already full HA. So by leveraging on the Amphoras, we can actually make sure that if one of the computes that is hosting the Amphoras dies, another compute is going to take over, spawn a new VM, which is going to take care of the role of HA proxy, and uh, your load will continue from now on, right? The portion that we still have in address is what we call the control plane. Okay, the control plane is still sitting on the OpenStack controllers. If the control plane dies, they are going to happen a number of things. If you are using DVR, you are still more or less okay because DVR will make sure that all the traffic going from your compute, from the instance itself to the external network is actually going not through the controllers but directly through the compute. Okay, this is what we call distributed virtual routing. So the controllers die, we don't need to go through them to the neutron server, to the neutron controllers. In order to reach external, everything is going directly for the compute. Now, what will happen if the controllers die is that if one of the compute dies and the amphora dies with it, we don't have the means to spawn a new amphora, all right? Because pretty much we don't have a control plane for the load balancer. So this is still, this is still one of the limitations. Let's take a look at the demo for the load balancer as a service. Uh, just now we test the load using curl we were able to see that it pretty much balanced across. Um, it should be nice if I actually show you the application before we move on. Okay, this is the virtual IP for my load balancer, 215. It's a pretty simple application and the database is actually being pulled from here. Okay, so we have all these rows coming from the database. Okay, later we will check on the database side that everything is pretty much the same on that side. And what I will do just now is run another script that is going to generate some load on my web one, okay? So like I said, just a simple DD. I'm going to DD from zero to null. I'm going to generate some CPU load, okay? Hopefully going back to Horizon, we should be able to see. Monask is pretty fast, so I am confident that it should be turning within the next few seconds. It's already coming up, okay? And now the portion that takes a bit longer is adding this load balancer into the monitoring features of Elbas. All right, that's the portion that is going to take slightly longer. So we can go back to load balancers. And I still cannot see it as a member. Okay. Let's give it a few seconds. My database is up and running, like we can see in the web server. So what I will do here is, um, let me just check that they have the scripts in place for the next use case. Yes, we do. All right, what I'm going to do while the long balancer keeps standing up is let me start another shell session and start talking about firewall as a service. Okay, I'm going to run a very simple test. Let's grab the floating IP for our load balancer I am able to ping it, all right? So I see MP attacks, uh, denial of service attacks, this kind of things, not a very good thing, right? So what I will do is I am going to create a firewall by code, which is going to block ICMP, but is still going to continue allowing the, the port 80 traffic. This can actually be seen from Horizon as well. If we go to firewalls, At the moment, I shouldn't have anything, okay? I don't have any rules, I don't have any policies, I don't have any firewalls whatsoever. 
So let's run the script very quickly. Oops. So we should be able to see some rules coming up. We are denying ICMP. We are allowing traffic to the port 8080. We are going to put these rules inside the policy. And lastly, the policy is going to be configuring a firewall. Coming back to Horizon, if I refresh this portion, we are able to see the firewall. We are able to see the policy. And the policy is holding two rules, OK? Let's test our load balancer again. Case number two. I should still allow traffic. Web one, web two, scale web. So this is our third web server, the one that we triggered the load, and it actually auto scale using hidden Monasca. It's already up and running. OK, so we have Elbas. We have Firewall as a service. We have hidden orchestration. All of this is pretty cool, right? Let me explain a bit more about Firewall as a service. OK, Firewall as a service is currently in version number one as of Newton. OK, still uh, not too much improvement on that side. It works as a perimeter firewall, but is not still considered a formal replacement for enterprise firewalls that you may have today in the data centers. Okay, the main reason why is because the implementation is still done by IP tables and it works at the neutron router level. So that's one of the key differentiators before, uh, between uh, security groups and firewall as a service. Security groups, as we will see later in the slides, this one is for firewall as a service. If we query the namespace for our queue router and we do an IP tables to check what's inside on it, I should be able to see that we have traffic for ICMP blocked on that side. I think I still have the firewall running. Let's just do a quick check here. OK, this is my queue router. Let me just try to copy this particular namespace. And let's run a simple IP table against the namespace. OK, we should be able to see that ICMP is pretty much being denied. There are quite a number of rules, but if we just grab. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I think it's better now. All right, this is our namespace for the Q router. OK, so if I grab ICMP, we should be able to see all the traffic being blocked, OK? So this is the way firewall as a service work at the neutron router level. If I destroy it, again by code, and I am pretty sure that I have the template here, yeah. And we run another query, again, the router namespace, we shouldn't be able to see anything, OK? And hopefully, I should be able to ping back the floating IP for my load balancer, which is still there. All right, so this is the way it works. What's the difference between firewall as a service and, um, and the security groups? All right, security groups, like we know, it's pretty much blocking at the instance level. But the way that really works is, again, IP tables. But the implementation of IP tables is in this particular case in OpenB switch. So if we run this particular command, again, our controller, we should be able to see that the, blocks, the, the ports that are allowed, in this case, 1521 for Oracle Listener, 8080 for Tomcat, all this implementation is actually done on the OpenB switch level. So this is the key difference between the two of them. Um, firewall as a service demo is the one that we run just now. And this is the trickiest use case. And I am looking to redeem myself on this one because we are supposed to, let me try to explain what we're going to do. We are supposed to freeze the Oracle database in production, quiet it. So in a way that you can still run transactions, right? But the database is in a consistent state for us to take a snapshot of the cinder volume, clone it, 
release the quiescing of the database so that we can continue with two means, uh, with commits. And then in the background, we're going to transfer that cinder volume to another tenant, which is going to be your developer and testing tenant, your DevOps team. And then they should be able to orchestrate the creation of an Oracle database server with a running instance, which is an exact copy of production. OK? Ah. Let me stop the slides. Um, before we start with the use case, what I will do is let me log out from my hit admin tenant, and I'm going to log in to another one that I call dev admin. OK, let's check the stack for this guy. There is nothing. There are no instances running, and more importantly, there is no volumes. So this is a empty tenant. There is nothing on it. OK. Let me go back to hit admin. Which is our production tenant. And to make the demo slightly more interesting, what I will do is I am going to run a query in our production database, and then I am going to start the process while the query is running so that we make sure that the database was up and running all the time. OK, now bear in mind that all these demos are running inside this Mac, so things may get a little bit slow in this particular use case. Uh, let's run the one that we call query. And this is going to be looping for quite a while. So it's just to check that the database is up and running. OK, let me jump back, jump back to my scripts. Close this screen because it's a little bit confusing. And let's kick out the clone. OK. So in the background, we should be able to see, hopefully, that the transactions are still going. I can see it from my monitor. I'm not sure if you can see it from there. I'm placing Oracle in backward mode. Again, this is Oracle commands. All of this script is driven by the Ansible. I am making sure that the database is in a consistent state because I've jumped to the next play, which is going to be to create a clone of the cinder volume by creating a snapshot first. OK, so database alter, I just put it into what we call backup mode. The snapshot was created. The moment that the snapshot is created, the lock is going to be releasing the database. All right, I have a consistent snapshot at the moment. So I am connecting again, and I am going to release the backup mode. I'm going to put it back in what we call end backup mode, so the database is able to allow commits once more. OK, and once we confirm that the database is altered, we can stop this transaction because at this point the database is as good as as it was before. I'm going to stop the transaction because I'm generating a lot of load at the moment. Okay, so while this one is running, which is going to last for about five minutes, if I'm lucky, let me explain a bit more of the use, this use case. All right, like I say, the Oracle server is under OpenStack control. So that allows us to pretty much control the whole environment by code using the REST APIs that we have. All right, so we can leverage in your favorite configuration management tool, being Ansible or Puppet or Salt. We can just use the scripts if you want. Any means that you find relevant, we can trigger this Cinder cloning. We just need to be able that the database is consistent before we actually clone the volume. OK? So let me try to explain step by step what we're doing in this demo. We have two environments. Production is on the left side, development tenant on the right side, which is empty. Production we are familiar with is pretty much what we started in the first use case with the heat orchestration template, OK? The development one, which is empty at the moment, is going to borrow from production this snapshot that we are taking, which is going to be converted to a clone. And in the next step, it's going to be transferred across to the development tenant. Once we have it in development, what will happen is we're going to trigger a header orchestration template, which is going to spawn our Oracle server in a, could be a provider network, or it could be external with a floating IP. In this case, I am using an external network with floating IP. It's going to attach the volume, and then we're going to start the Oracle service, all right? 
If we start the Oracle service, the database is going to be consistent. We are missing one step. We will need to do the alter database roll forward in order to pretty much read all the archive modes that we are copying also from, from production and just make sure that we reach exactly the same consistent state as the time that we took the snapshot. Okay, so if the developers ask, is this uh, an exact copy of the actual running production database? No, it was a copy of perhaps one hour back when we actually took the snapshot. Okay, so let's see how this script is going. Let me stop the, the slides once more. Okay, we created a snapshot, we created a volume, and we should be in the process of removing the snapshot. Let's check in Horizon. This is our production 10, and let's go to volumes. I can see a Oracle clone being created. It's actually a waiting transfer. So we are in the step in which we are going to transfer this guy to our development tenant. The snapshot is already deleted. I cannot see it anymore. So what I will do is let me log out from production. Let me go back to testing. And soon enough, we should be able to see a volume coming through. It's not a snapshot, it's a volume. Yeah, okay, we have it there. Okay, next step, we are creating a stack. Let's go to orchestration, stacks. Create complete, that was pretty fast actually. Okay, this is our stack. It's pretty simple at the moment. It's not as complex as the other one. We only have one network in this case, which is our database network going to external through the virtual router that we have. And hopefully my Ansible is going to assign a floating IP to this particular database server within the next few seconds, and we should be able to connect to this server and make sure that we have a running database. Oh, before that, of course, we are supposed to start the database and roll forward, okay? Creating dev stack. This has a slip condition, which is going to wait for about 30 seconds to get the stack again before it continues. <coughs> so in the meantime, let me just quickly go back to the demo, and there is something that I want to share with you guys. Now, usually the, the kind of questions that I get at the end of the session is, where can I get the scripts? I have a GitHub repo. If you want, you can take a picture. So pretty much all the Ansible playbooks, the scripts that I use, the heat orchestration template, everything is located here. So if you want to grab it, if you want to have a play, please feel free to do so. And uh, if you have any trouble, running it, just drop me a mail. My email was in the very first slide, which I am going to share with Iwan anyway at the end of the session, so he can distribute. All right, guys, I think this is all I have at the moment. So what I will do is hopefully wait for the demo to finish, which is associating the floating IP instance to the database. And once the floating IP is assigned, we should be able to connect to the server, bring the database up, and I'm going to run a quick test. I think that we have some time for questions. Do we? Okay, um, we have a couple of minutes for questions um, just while the next speaker, Sander, is um, coming down and starting to set up. So if you have any questions, put your hand up. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any takers right now. Um, I'm sure Alex will be around and happy to take questions later. Can we thank the speaker? Yes, guys, that was it. Very quickly, let me just finish. Database alter means we already rolled forward. I have an IP for the database, and hopefully this time is running. I have an Oracle process, that's a good sign. My instance is open. Let's connect to my 
particular uh, schema. All right, and let's just run a query against uh, sons. Okay, so I don't know, I, I saw that there was some people from Singapore, so pretty much what we are seeing here is Singapore suburbs. So everything that is showing in the database are Singapore suburbs. If we go back to this particular place, which is production, we should be able to match exactly the same, which are the same records coming from production to our development tenant. All right, guys, thank you for coming. If you want to ask me any personal questions later on, I will be around. Thank you so much. We have a short break now. Um, we're starting the next talk at 5-2. So if you're planning on leaving and going somewhere else, now's the